yes, yes. <laughs> class? Which is fine, as long as there's no test. Yeah. All right, good afternoon, class. Good afternoon. <laughs> Recess is over. Recess is over. <laughs> Take your seat. Mm, yes. All right, um, how are we doing this afternoon, class? Great. Good. Very good. Um, we're going to be talking about um, the, his the history of our country, uh, which I believe we all know the name by now. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Which one? No, I'm done. The name of the country? Well, the name of the country. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> no. Botswana, come on. Bo Botswana. Bo yeah, very good. Botswana. You know, most, most people would say Botswana. Yeah. So yeah. it's not Botswana. Botswana is B-A. So the country is Botswana. Yeah? Botswana. Bo Botswana is B-O. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Botswana is the people Bo of the country. The people of the country are Botswana. And then um, the, peop uh, the, the, the language is Setswana. Right? Botswana and Botswana speak in Setswana. Alright? Okay, this is the map of our country, Botswana. Uh, Botswana is a land blocked country. We don't have access to the ocean or sea. We are surrounded by other countries. In the west here, we have Namibia, which is that side. Mm -hmm. Then up here, north, we have Zambia, northeast, Zimbabwe. And down here is a country which I always like to name, Country X. It's a country which is not yet uh, named. You know, we're still waiting for them to name it. At the moment, they're calling it by its direction. South. <laughs> South. <laughs> South. So, okay. It's not a name, it's a direction. Eh? It's North Africa, but we don't say North Africa. This country is called North Africa. But they say South Africa, so it's a direction. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. All right. Botswana is said to be about the same size as Texas, the state of Texas, mm -hmm. with over just over 2 million people. Right. And 40% of the country... 40% of the whole country is set aside uh, for wildlife management areas. Wow. 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 Hayes, wildlife wow. Management areas. 40%. 40%. That's awesome. Of the country. Well, we still have um, in land, you know, the size of Texas. Texas is a very big state, right? With how, many, mm -hmm. how many people there in Texas? A lot. Uh, it's, it's a lot. So we just, just over 2 million people. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, those uh, WMAs, Wildlife Management Areas, will, will be the area that we drove in. This is the Chobe National Park. It's one of those uh, uh, wildlife management areas, mm -hmm. Chobe National Park. And then again, down here, we have the Naipen National Park and the Makadikadi National Park right here. And then, of course, we have the Okavango Delta, which is uh, also a protected area. And uh, in the Okavango Delta, there's a game reserve called the Muremi game reserve right there. Mm -hmm. and then right here in the central part is the central Kalahari game reserve where the first inhabitants of uh, the country are still, uh, well, are still there with the Bushmen. Mm. Yeah. And then down here we have the Kalahari Transfrontier which we share with South Africa. Okay. But uh, we're not showing the South African part, just showing this, uh, the Botswana part, but it goes all the way into South Africa. Mm. Yeah. So 40% of this is just set aside for uh, wildlife management areas. And um, first income provider for the country, mining, is mining, it's first, then second, it's tourism, and then third, it's beef. Mm. Beef used to be second, uh, but due to the foot and mouth uh, disease, that dropped the beef market. And then tourism overtook uh, the beef to become number two, and then number three, um, speak. All right. Okay. Now, if I go back in the 1800s, <laughs> in history now, um, when we had uh, when there was the scramble for Africa, we all know the scramble for Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This is when Western countries um, came down to Africa, um, grabbing pieces of land, um, colonizing countries, and um, like for example, Namibia. Uh, this Namibia was colonized by the Germans, which was a German colony. And then Angola, up here, uh, was a Portuguese colony. Mm. Zambia and Zimbabwe, it was uh, a British colony, right. Zambia and Zimbabwe. Uh, it was Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia. So this was uh, just one. So it was a British colony. And then South Africa also was also a British colony. 
but also there were some Dutch that settled down in South Africa. So before the Europeans came, were there divisions as far as countries or no? It was the just Europeans that made the called them names before it was just tribes. Yes. But yeah. they and so tribes had certain just areas. Yes, they would be like, okay, this area here belongs to um, so and so with this tribe. Right. And then this area will be for that tribe. But uh, not really borders. There were no borders cut um, like now. Like right. when the Europeans came uh, right. to, to Africa. They did that. Yes, they did. Thank you. Uh, there was, uh, they held, uh, there was a conference held in Berlin. Um, so these countries, they met and they discussed, you know, about, uh, you know, making the borders uh, in, 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 in these countries that they colonized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I talked about Namibia, Angola, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and South Africa. But I left out Botswana. Our country. Mm -hmm. So Botswana was not <coughs> colonized. So nobody wanted Botswana. Mm. Oh. <laughs> that could have been a good thing. Well, <laughs> mm. the main reason is uh, that they, you know they were looking for countries with uh, minerals. Right. Yeah, countries that were rich in minerals like diamond, gold, sort of all, all those uh, minerals. Mm -hmm. So back then Botswana was. Uh, considered to be a dry area, a desert, with no minerals whatsoever. Again, they didn't get to explore it that much because, you know, back in the days, the main mode of transport were ships. So it wasn't easy to access the country. So they, even though some people came in, but they didn't get to explore it that much. Yeah. So it was just uh, left there, untouched, uncolonized. Nobody wanted it. And um, in the meantime, time in South Africa down here, there were um, tribal wars going down here in South Africa. Um, the tribes were fighting uh, among, with the dominating among each other. Yes, yes, with the dominating tribe being the tribe of the Zulu, led by King Shaga. So um, King Shaga, what he wanted to do was to expand his kingdom main fight uh, they were fighting for land you know so shaga wanted to expand his kingdom so he fought you know other tribes you know he was a very skillful man uh, in the art of warfare because you know how they fought the tribes fought um, one tribe would stand here and then another tribe would stand there with spears and shield and then they'll throw the spears at another right at, at, at each other throwing the spears hoping that the spear will maybe will just catch one of, uh, of of the other other tribe, so when Shaga came in, um, he saw that uh, that's not war. This is just a game. So he introduced a method called the cow horn formation. So what he did, um, he had a short stabbing spear and a big shield uh, that would cover mm -hmm. from head to toe. Mm -hmm. So he would stand here with his uh, troops and then let the other tribe throw their spears at them and then they will block those spears and once those that the, that army runs out of right. spears mm -hmm. that's when he would attack he and his army would attack <laughs> he forward and then with the troops coming behind and as they get closer they'll open up the flanks and then encircle the other um, mm. the other tribe and then stab them to death so that was one method that had uh, people fearing Shaka. Mm. So Shaka, he was a king that didn't sit back and watch his troops go to war. He led his troops to victory after victory. So people were very, very, tribes were very afraid of Shaka, uh, the Zulu kingdom. So he killed more people of tribes and then took their land, took their cattle. And then we had some <coughs> tribes fleeing from South Africa, fleeing here and then entering into Botswana. Because Botswana didn't have a lot of people, just the Bushmen, only the first inhabitants of the country, the Bushmen, that settled mainly in the central part. Uh, Bushmen, just the name they were called by the missionaries, but their real name is the Sen. The Sen. Yeah, the, the missionaries called them the Bushmen because they lived out in the bush 
hunted uh, wild animals and gathered uh, wild fruits. So they were called the Bushmen. So, but their their real name is the same. All right. So one tribe fled um, from South Africa and then entered here into Botswana. And then they settled right around here uh, in this area. This is where the first tribe settled here, and another tribe later fled again, fleeing the wars in in South Africa <coughs> and then settling um, right here. And then the third tribe later on again settled right here. So this would become the three major tribes of the country. They found the Bushmen, Bushmen peaceful people. Um, also, they are not people of war. So they settled, coexisted well with uh, with each other. So they did. Bushmen didn't mind company. <coughs> so one tribe settled here, and another one here, and another one right here. So they were away, away from Shaga. Now they felt, okay, now we think we're safe. He won't reach us here. Another threat would come um, again from a rich British industrialist uh, called Cecil John Rhodes. Cecil John Rhodes was a very rich, powerful man. He wanted to build a railway line from Cape all the way up to Cairo. Mm -hmm. you know, from the bottom of Africa mm -hmm. all the way up to the top of Africa. So he wanted, because Botswana was uncolonized, nobody said, like, um, <coughs> we own this country. So Botswana was uncolonized, so it was going to be easy for him to just take over this, uh, this land. So what he wanted to do, um, like I said, to build a railway line passing through the country Botswana, and then Botswana was to be made a railway station. That was his intention, to take the whole country, just for it to make it his um, railway station. Mm -hmm. And then the three senior chiefs of the tribes that settled here, here and here, um, saw this uh, as a threat, a very big threat. Uh, the chief Kama of the, the tribe that settled here, Kama the third, and then chief uh, Bakwen of uh, the Bakwena, which settled here, and then chief um, Sibeli of the Bamwaketi, the tribe that settled here. So these three um, senior chiefs at the time um, got together and then talked you know, and said, you know, we are going to lose our land. So we must do something about this. So they embarked on a journey to to um, to England, oh. yeah, <laughs> to London. And then when they got there, well, they were accompanied by one missionary. I don't know if it was John Mackenzie. I think it was John Mackenzie that accompanied them to to England, London. And then they met uh, with a man called Joseph Chamberlain. Joseph Chamberlain was the Secretary of State for Colonies. That was in 1885 when they went to, um, to, to England, 1885. And then they met with Joseph Chamberlain, Secretary of State for Colonies, and then they petitioned him for protection. He didn't have that power to like say, okay, we are going to protect you as Britain. And then he forwarded them to the Queen. At the time, that was Queen Victoria. He forwarded them to Queen Victoria and they met with the queen and then they asked for protection but protection uh, they declined the queen declined protection because you know botswana like i said it was considered a dry area a desert um, with nothing to gain and then they didn't want to like uh, use their money or resources on something that they're not going to benefit from so but our chiefs didn't give up they didn't give up they stayed there then negotiated, renegotiated, and then you know it was all over the news uh, that um, there are some there are chiefs uh, from the country Botswana. They are seeking protection from Britain, but uh, they are declining. So, with the media coverage, and again they gained uh, the support from the British public. Then that put a bit of pressure on the Queen. And the Queen eventually said, ah, "Okay, no, we will uh, protect you." So same year, 1885, that was the same year they went to um, London. Uh, that was 1885, and the same year again, uh, protection was granted. So this became, Botswana became a protectorate. Not a colony, but a protectorate. Yes. 
And uh, since Botswana was undeveloped, um, there had to be an administrative center. So the administrative center was set um, in South Africa, not far from the, the border of Botswana, an area called Mafikeng, called Mafikeng, a town called Mafikeng, uh, just right here. Because, you know, South Africa was a bit developed. You know, Botswana was still like a dusty area, no development. So but they set up the, the, the administrative center in Mafikeng. So Botswana became the only country that had its administrative centers outside the borders. Right. British troops were deployed along the border lines. <clears throat> now that's when they got the chance now to explore the country further. Because now they were close and now they could now explore the country slowly, bit by bit. Protection was granted, we were happy. Fast forward, 19, let's say 1940s there, um, we had um, um, heir to the Bamato throne uh, called Sir Seretsakama, who went to London, Oxford University, to study law. While he was there in Oxford University studying law, he met a beautiful English woman by the name Ruth Williams. They fell in love and they wanted to get married. But you know how it was back in the days. Uh, there was a law even in South Africa that there shall be no interracial marriages. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, with white and black mixing, it was like an insult to, to the whites. So they didn't want that. Even the uncle who was acting chief um, while the son was away studying, um, and he was the uncle to Seretsakama, and then he also didn't want uh, that marriage. He told his nephew that don't even think of marrying that white lady, because you'll get us into trouble. No. <laughs> so um, he said, if you're going to go ahead and marry that white lady, don't come back here. Mm. Stay mm. there. Mm. Yeah. But you know, nothing would stop them. Even the parents of Ruth Williams actually didn't um, support that uh, they didn't want uh, that marriage. But especially the father. You know, it was like you know, your daughter is marrying a black, you know, all eyes on you, so you won't be looked uh, nicely by uh. the family. So, so uh, but uh, they, they were very much in love and they nothing wouldn't stand in their way. So they went ahead and got married. Yeah. And then um, there came a time that now he finished schooling and then he had to come back to the country. The uncle still said, don't come with that white lady today, to our country. And again, the people here and, you know, the uncle poisoned um, the people against the, 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 the chief, uh, well, heir to the chief, I mean heir to the throne. <coughs> he poisoned the, uh, the people against that and uh, the people also didn't want um, a white lady as, as their, their queen. But then he came, he came to the country with, uh, with his wife and uh, he met with the uncle, the uncle was very angry and then he called him aside and they sat down, they talked. He said, we are going to call a Kotla meeting. Kotla is um, a gathering place um, where a tribe, <coughs> a tribe or a community of, let's say a village would go to a Kotla and sit down, discuss issues, um, issues about what's happening in, in their community. So, the quota. So, you are going to call a quota meeting, <coughs> you are going to sit down, you are going to relinquish your chieftains. The uncle told uh, the nephew that, that you are no longer going to be the chief if you still um, still with this uh, white woman. <coughs> the meeting was called, everybody went to the quota. <laughs> and then Sereza Kama stood in front of the people and then he told the people about um, you know how much he loves his wife and he would understand if the people um, don't want him as, as um, their chief. So the people like I said uh, the uncle poisoned the people uh, you know against Sereza Kama and the, the wife. So the people didn't want the, the white woman as their queen. So after the meeting, uh, <coughs> he was exiled 
Now he was exiled back to London. Raza Kamo was exiled back to London. So he stayed there for a few years. But while he, when he got there, um, he got into politics. He got into politics, but he didn't give up, you know, negotiating with the uncle. He talked with the uncle, communicated with the uncle, that uh, uncle, you know, with the knowledge that I've gained, you know, from London, you know, I could serve my country. I think I could improve the livelihood of my people. So let me come back home and use the skills, the skills that I have gained here yeah, in, 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 in London. Um, let me come back and serve uh, my country. The uncle said, not with that white woman. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. But he stayed there, studied politics. <coughs> and then, you know, eventually the people said, ah, you know what, even if he married a white woman, he's still our chief. So we want him back. Because mm. he was probably the smartest man in the country. The most educated, you know. So, <laughs> because he was the only one that went as far as London studying, you know, law. Yeah. So the people put pressure on the uncle again to, to bring back um, the, 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 the chief. And then he was allowed to come back. He came back to the country and um, everybody was happy. And then when he came back to the country, he, because of the politics uh, that he studied when he got there, he um, started a political party called the Botswana Democratic Party. And then we had another opposition parties as well that were formed. And um, there were elections held in 1965, 30th of September. And then Seretse Kama uh, won those elections. And he became the prime minister of the country. Mm. Prime minister. And then um, after that, you know, since the, Brit the, Brit the British, um, you know, protected us, like I said, that's when they started to explore the country. They suspected uh, diamonds in the area. They suspected diamonds. But after um, Saratse Kama won the elections, um, he saw that the British are suspecting some mineral uh, in, in the country. So he quickly asked for independence. But the British were reluctant. They said, no, you're not going to be able to govern yourself. Um, okay, we'll give you one year waiting period to see if indeed you will uh, be able to govern yourself. So I believe this one year, they used this one year um, to search thoroughly, to search the country thoroughly for, for, for the diamonds, hmm. for the minerals. So um, they searched and searched. Uh, all he said is that uh, God was on our side, and then he pointed them to the, all the wrong directions. <laughs> you know, they searched in all the wrong places, looking for diamonds, and then eventually they said, "Ah, no, you know, you can have your country. Um, you have no no minerals, nothing." And then 1966, 30th of September, um, we got our independence, and then Seretse Kama um, became president, head of state. He became the president of the country. And then he hired uh, geologists from um, DBS. And then that's when God shined the light right here. Mm. He said, go and search right here. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. 1967, a year after we got our independence, diamonds were discovered. Yeah. In this area here called Orapa. This is uh, our first the diamond mine that was discovered in 1967. And then another one later on, right here, not far from the first one, right here called Letakani, was also um, discovered. And then all the way down here is another diamond mine, closer to the capital city. Well, the capital city, after gaining our independence, you know, we had to move now from South Africa. And then um, the administrative center moved, the, and then our capital city became here, Kabroni. This is where our capital city is. So this third mine is said to be the richest diamond mine by value in the world. Joining mine. Quality diamonds. <clears throat> our president wasn't selfish. After they discovered of diamonds, he went to the people and said, uh, told the people that we have discovered a very beautiful gemstone. 
So this gemstone is not only going to benefit me and my family, but it's going to benefit the whole country. All of us as Batswana. So we never had any blood diamonds. So from being in the top 10 poorest countries in the world, after the <coughs> discovery of diamonds, Botswana became one of the countries with the fastest growing economy. <coughs> thanks to the diamonds. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions before yeah. I proceed? I have seen the film, I can't remember the name of it, the whole story of how all of this took place. The United Nation. It was wonderful. The United Nation. Oh yeah, that's right. Yes. Have yeah, you ever seen. tried looking for oil? Oil, uh, you know, they always try and look for more, more and more minerals. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, they haven't found any oil. No. But they are mining Call now, up it's just, just diamonds. <laughs> Um, copper, nickel, and coal. Uh -huh. Yeah, so those are the main things. And soda ash, those are the main things that you mine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Since you're landlocked, were you somewhat protected by the slave trade? Or did you have a lot of people taken as slaves and brought to America? No, brought to the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that was the to the world. Yeah. There was not a lot of that happening because, like I said, landlocked right. Right. and then mode of transport back then was ships right. so how would you just travel all the way in bring people all the way out yeah. to the yeah. ocean and then take them too much time and money to yeah, exactly. west africa yeah yeah, yeah. this yeah. um <coughs> reserve in the middle now it must be the most remote desert. yes now is it desert it's mainly desert yes mainly desert, mainly desert. now do they have they are uh, uh Different type of wildlife there. Uh huh. And wildlife they animals that, that that prefer much dry areas, okay. like the Hemsbok or Oryx. Mm -hmm. It's one of the animals that you see uh, here, and but they, you won't find it anywhere. Do you know. they have like tours and all into that part of the country? Yes, they do. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, wilderness has um, a camp again in 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 the in the Kalahari. Yeah, called Kalahari Plains. All right, now from the discovery of the diamonds now, that's when we started to see Botswana grow. You know, roads were built, schools, um, hospitals, clinics in, like, mostly in each and every, in most of the villages. Well, depending on how big the village is, there will be a hospital or a clinic if it's small. There will be a primary school, junior school, high school if it's a very big, big area. And in towns and cities, you'll have universities, you'll have um, colleges, all right? Primary education, there is primary school. Education, primary school is seven years. Um, standard one up to standard seven. That's seven years. Each standard taking one year. And then after standard seven, you move to junior school. Junior school is three years. That's form one, form two, and form three. That's three years in junior school. And then senior school, that's two years. That's form four and form five. And then after senior school, depending on how well you have performed, that's when you go to university. So education here, folks, is free. Even mm. university, after you have passed your, your O-levels, uh, you go to university for free. Uh, even the government will even give um, university students allowances, monthly allowance. Mm. It's like they get paid to learn. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah. wow. Do you all have a personal tax? Tax, or, a, yes. or a sales tax, or income tax? Uh -huh. Income tax, sales tax, you know, property tax. Yeah, there is. Well, it, again, in, it will depend on how much you're earning. Mm -hmm. There is a certain amount that the government would say, okay, if you earn this much, you'll get taxed. But if you earn less than that, you don't get taxed at all. Mm -hmm. So the higher you earn, the more taxed you earn. Mm -hmm. And the corporate tax? Yes. You yeah. have a also, also corporate tax, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to health. Like I said, there will be a clinic or health post, uh, depending on how big the, the, the village or town is. So health is also free. If you're not feeling well, you go to the nearest clinic or hospital with your medical card, then see a nurse or a doctor, then tell him or her how you're feeling, and then you write and prescribe some medication for you, you go and yeah, 
the pharmacy get the medication for free. Mm. Yeah. But we do have private hospitals though. There are some private hospitals uh, that you have to pay. Well, they are, uh, they are better than government hospitals. But government hospital, that's for free. Mm. HIV and AIDS, it's still a problem in the country. With, uh, you know, our population of just over 2 million people, we have about 403,000 people infected. So these are recorded cases. Mm. Recorded cases, about 403,000. So there's still some more that, you know, obviously <coughs> some um, that uh, haven't, you know, uh, tested yet. But yeah, I think the, the numbers will be maybe more than that. But the government is also giving those uh, who are infected free um, antiretroviral drugs. Mm. Yeah. For free. Wow. But again, we have some foundations that we are helping, like the Bill Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are helping with uh, about the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Why is it so high? Sorry? Why? Why is it so high? Um, you know, it was lack of education. I think uh, when it got in, you know, it was lack of education. People didn't uh, know much about uh, the, the disease. And, you know, but nowadays, you know, the government is trying by all means to teach um, at an early age. Like, uh, sex education now is taught in primary schools mm. at a very uh, early, early age. Sex education. Back then, you know, I wasn't taught sex education in, in, in primary school, so now the government starting at an early age to teach about the dangers of HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. So they are doing the best they can mm -hmm. to try and teach everyone about the, the dangers of AIDS. Yeah. Yeah. Since the country is 50 years old, where do you see it the next 50? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll be dead. Nobody be here. I think we we're still going. We're still developing. We are still a developing country. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have um, uh, a long way to go, but uh, we're doing very well at the moment. I see us. Uh, maybe in the next fifty years, we'll be like the states. Mm -hmm. Well, not 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 that, that in a, not the bad part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my deal is, what happens if the diamonds run out? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Eh? I don't know. I don't know what they'll do. You know, um, I mean, that's that's a problem you got when you, you don't diversify or try to get other things going on. Right now, it's tourism helping, you know, a lot. Yeah, tourism is second, if, yeah. If that, if those diamond mines run out, y'all have to find something else. Yeah, I think they're working on that. They, don't, they won't just sit back and say, ah, we have diamonds. I think guys at the top there are working on that. Uh, that thing. Okay, what's if what's plan B if we run out of diamonds? I think they are, they are working on that. They won't just sit back and say, ah. All right, our time is running out. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's interesting talk. Thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will be, if we think of anything, we still need to we'll talk more about that. Then we can continue, or maybe during dinner or something. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.